Um, I'd just like to um, uh, mention my disclosures and I'd like to say a big thank you to Medacta for hosting this event and the opportunity to present uh, our information today. So my uh, brief is to talk about the wave sign and I want to start with the definition. It's characterized by a delamination of the articular cartilage at the level of the chondral label junction. And this represents essentially um, outside in damage. And the mechanism is ultimately a uh, force being transmitted to the articular cartilage by the acetabular labrum. So we go back to basic science cartilage. Uh, we know articular cartilage is predominantly uh, water, 65 to 85%, 65 to 80% water. And within the cartilage is uh, chondrocytes, proteoglycans, and collagen, predominantly type 2 collagen. Uh, however, we know articular cartilage um, has. Uh, its own challenges of healing because it's alymphatic, aneural, and alymphatic, um, and avascular, I should say. And we know that the articular cartilage is firmly attached to the subchondral bone by the calcified cartilage layer. So in the acetabular cartilage, we know the thickness varies being thickest in the anterior superior segment and in, uh, thinnest in the posterior inferior segment. And when we look at cartilage biomechanics, we know it, uh, it, it demonstrates biphas biphasic creep uh, pro and stress relaxation properties. And what I mean by that is that uh, under constant load, the, the fluid within the cartilage extravasates out and the thickness of the cartilage diminishes. And uh, on unloading of the cartilage, the fluid flows back into the cartilage and allows the thickness of the cartilage to be maintained. However, in, in a disease state, these uh, factors are significantly affected. So what is the basic science of a wave sign? We know that there's a detachment of the articular surface from the subchondral bone, and this uh, effectively compromises the mechanical properties of articular cartilage, leading it to premature damage potentially. And this uh, was looked at more closely by Bob Boulay's group in 2014, and they reported that they asked the question, is it worth uh, trying to salvage these articular cartilage lesions and they found that there was up to 95% chondrocyte viability within these patients who had FAI symptoms and uh, this uh, result of 90% does vary in the literature and it ranges from 40% to 90%. So what are the patterns of damage that we observe uh, with the wave sign? We know in CAM lesions it effectively, uh, essentially affects the anterior superior segment and in mixed uh, cam and pincer lesion affects predominantly the similar lesions. And in pincer lesions, it affects less commonly the anterior superior and anterior inferior segments. So why is the anterior superior segment most commonly affected? Effectively, there's an intrinsic weak point in the anterior superior part of the articular cartilage due to there being a transition zone. And Bob Boulay's group looked at this closely and asked the question, why does it always fail in this region? And they reported that the collagen fibers are orientated more parallel in the anterior superior segment, making it more prone to shear stress from potential CAM lesion. And posteriorly, inferiorly, the, the collagen fibers are more perpendicular and divergent uh, to the articular surface, uh, rendering it more stable. So in theory, the natural history of a wave sign, if left untreated, one could argue is that the cartilage um, uh, delamination effectively is uh, 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 mechanical strength is compromised and more prone to it uh, breaking off into a loose body, effectively leaving a substantial defect and leading to premature arthritis. So I think we need to have a strategy to be able to diagnose and, uh, and, and treat this early on in the equation. So unfortunately, the history and examination and uh, conventional MRI scans uh, yield uh, very little to specifically uh, diagnosing the wave sign. And more recently, quantitative MRI imaging using voxel-based relaxometry uh, is more helpful in detecting delamination of the cartilage. And up until uh, more recently, this has been very difficult to detect um, in the absence of having traction MRI scans. So the gold standard for diagnosing um, wave signs remains arthroscopically. And essentially what you're trying to do is uh, push on the chondral label junction, observing the presence of cartilage delamination. And usually it's associated with a, uh, a bubble sign or a carpet sign often described. And the, the, the size of the lesion can vary depending on the um, underlying pathology. So once you've observed and made the diagnosis 
of um, the wave sign, one has to think of a system to classify the, the lesion. And the most widely reported classification systems that are out there in the literature are the outer bridge and the Beck classification. However, there's no real universal agreement as to which one we should be using. So one of the weaknesses with the outer bridge classification is that it was originally designed for, for the knee and based on uh, the uh, patella. And it really doesn't describe what we find in the wave sign. Uh, Martin Beck was the first one to really describe the wave sign in his classification and he, and he marked it as grade two and it, it described the cartilage um, lesion as a carpet lesion. However, one of the weaknesses is it didn't really quantify this lesion. So, and, and likewise, Victor Elitsuri alongside Thomas Bird and, Marks, and, and uh, Tom Sampson described the anatomical zones, again, again providing a descriptive um, location of the cartilage lesion, but not really quantifying it. And it was only until recently uh, Conan and Haddad uh, was able to not only describe the uh, articular uh, wave sign lesion as a, as a grade one, but also was able to describe the, the size of the defect and effectively divided the acetabulum into thirds. And uh, so he was the first, this is the first classification that described the, the actual wave sign and, and the size of it. However, it didn't really uh, help us with management of this condition. And um, John O'Donnell uh, reported uh, on a paper recently looking at which was the most reliable classification system out of the, the most widely quoted classifications. That's the outer bridge, the Beck and the Haddad, and found that the Haddad had the, the best intra-observer reliability. Um, and all of the classification systems had comparable intra-observer reliability. One of the classifications that wasn't considered in this paper was the Tom Sampson classification. And he really describes uh, quite, quite eloquently what we actually see in the acetabulum during a wave sign and describes the, the wave sign and the associated chondral label junction, whether it's stable or unstable. So it really does help guide mm -hmm. us to the, the treatment. So what treatment options do we have and what are the toolboxes that we can use um, but well, we've got label stabilization techniques to treat a wave sign and we can we can um, consider using a glue and also microfracture and these three uh, tools are most widely quoted in the literature and certainly in my toolbox when considering a wave sign um, repair so this is a video illustration showing uh, a very um, a small wave sign so i would say this is a small wave sign very small area delamination with an unstable conjure label junction and I treated this uh, with uh, suture stabilization alone. And I think I achieved a stabilization of the conjugal junction and no further bubbling or carpet sign was observed with the articular cartilage. Uh, Medacta have now uh, finally released their own version of the uh, Adnoclus anchor. It's a peak anchor, 2.4 metal lock peak anchor. And uh, I've certainly been using this more recently and uh, one of the um, significant things in the preclinical testing they found was that the pullout strength is uh, 6.4 times stronger than what's required in the ISO standard. And I recently sort of um, got through my learning curve with this anchor and finding it very helpful, um, not less device. What about Tom Sampson? So what Tom Sampson describes is his technique is using um, a microfracture technique. So he takes down the conjure label junction and corrects the um, uh, pincer lesion. And then he repairs the um, conjure label junction with a suture. And his study recently was published in the journal Hip Preservation Surgery. It's quite a unique study. It's, 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 uh, there's a paucity of these kind of studies reports in the literature. And what he did was he reported on his revision cases and he had identified that 13 of his revision cases had uh, at the index operation of wave sign repair using his technique. And what he found was 11 of those 13 patients still uh, had an intact wave sign. There was no signs of that wave sign using his technique, demonstrating there's an 85% efficacy in this low volume case series. And only two of the cases um, continue to have wave signs. 
And in his paper, he reported that was due to the fact that there was residual impingement in the hip. What about Richard Villa's technique? This is widely quoted in the literature, and Richard Villa was the first one to describe the use of fibrin glue in the articular cartilage. Uh, so, uh, and what he does is he uh, takes down the chondrolabral junction microfractures behind the articular wave sign and then uses fibrin glue and does not use any suture repair. And one of the tips for using fibrin glue, I find that the needles can be quite flexible. So what I've started doing is using a rigid curette and putting the tips of the needle into the rigid curette and it allows very accurate placement of the fibrin glue using this technique. So what were the results of Richard Villa's technique? So he reported two case series and one was to 12 month follow and the other one was 28 month follow up. And both showed significant improvement in modified hair reciprocal, particularly in pain and function. So let's talk about fibrin glue. Is it uh, the, 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 um, the glue we should all be using? Well, it works by uh, adhering the delaminated cartilage back to the subchondral bone. And it does this by a process of encouraging migration and proliferation of the chondrocytes to the areas of damaged cartilage. But there are some drawbacks with this. Recently, Patrick Weinreich in Queensland reported two cases of septic arthritis using this product. And when interrogated uh, about this product, Baxter argued that, yeah, in theory, you can get a, an infection. And that's due to the fact that the fibrin product is pulled from human plasma, which in theory is a, uh, 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 can carry the risk of uh, viral and associated blood pathogen infections. So are there any, are there any alternatives uh, into fibrin glue? Yes, there are. I mean, there's, there's uh, cyanacrylate is the group of glues that are alternatives and they have a quicker polymerization, higher uh, bonding strength, and they also are uh, bacteria static, which is um, a useful consideration when using glues based on Patrick Weinreich's report. And the one probably we're most familiar with is Dermabond that we use for skin closure. So what uh, CASA recently reported was a biomechanical study looking at which was the most durable, fibrin, um, cyanacrylates, or suture repair techniques in the lab for wave sign. And what they found that the fibrin uh, uh, glue technique only withstood 25 to 50 cycles. With the um, cyanacrylate uh, technique, they found that there were some early signs of failure after 100 cycles, but it was durable up to 1,000 cycles. And with the suture technique, whilst they saw a little bit of suture cutout at 50 cycles, it was durable up to 1,500 cycles. So this graph shows that in the purple line that the suture technique was the strongest and most durable. The cyanacrylate was the second and the fibrin glue was the, the least durable. So the other thing that we use in our toolbox is microfracture. And uh, I think uh, in some cases that I've done, certainly microfracture is reasonably straightforward. And in other cases, it can be very uh, awkward, particularly if you're not at the right angle and perpendicular to the subchondral bone. And uh, this is a, a method I came across during my literature review, which is reported in 2018 by Lynn Artra and is using retrograde microfracture technique. And you use a proximal accessory portal and you clear the capsular tissue uh, correctly, um, acetabular uh, deformity, and then you perform a microfracture. Some of the challenges with this retrograde microfracture technique are that um, accurately placing the drill, particularly in a slow volume or small volume acetabulum, directly into the area where the wave sign is, and theoretically there's a risk of damage to the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh with the proximal accessory portal. And like um, uh, there's always a risk with uh, everything we do with microfracture. If you use conventional size awls, one of the, the risks is that you could potentially damage uh, an area of the subchondral bone plate, particularly if it's a significant articular cartilage lesion. Also one of the downsides of using microfracture is it can lead to compaction and sometimes doesn't penetrate all the way through to the subchondral bone. And one way around is to use drilling techniques. But one of the risks of drilling is also thermal necrosis. So I think uh, there's certainly a move towards nanofracture drilling, which can avoid these complications. However, some of the nanofracture drills that are out there are not perfect. So there's certainly room for improvement as some of these drill bits can break off. So we recently completed a systematic review that we submitted to the Journal of Arthroscopy uh, looking at uh, defining and managing the wave sign. I'll just share some of the 
the, the, the findings during that uh, review, we found that the commonest risk factor for wave sign was indeed femoral tabular impingement, particularly large alpha angles and more common in males. The acetabular over coverage appeared to be a protective factor for the wave sign and uh, it was more common in the older age group. Indeed, the Haddad classification, as John reported, was the most reliable and the fibrin glue was the most commonly reported treatment option and, and did report some good early outcomes. So in conclusion, um, the literature is very limited in contrast to Jit Bullock Balakumar's uh, um, talk, uh, where, the, where the literature is very poor quality, that lacks control groups, and it's often difficult to compare one technique with the other. And the, whilst the suture technique uh, is superior in biomechanical tests, there's very few clinical studies showing this. And Villa technique still remains the gold standard amongst the clinical studies, uh, although there's no uh, current uh, paper or evidence showing one technique is superior to the other. So in my own practice, when I've got a small uh, wave sign, I use this uh, suture stabilization technique. And if I've got a moderate to large wave sign, I'll incorporate the microfacturing glue to supplement the uh, stabilization technique after I've corrected the bony deformity. Thank you for all your attention.